As a student of comparative Indian literature at the Department of Modern Indian Languages and Literary Studies, University of Delhi, it was common to walk down our department's corridor and overhear lectures and conversations in Bengali, Kannada, Assamese, Tamil, Gujarati, Sindhi, Hindi, and English. It was also common to sit in your teacher's rooms and listen to your batchmates nervously present ideas while squirming in your seat, hoping your turn never arrives. What I would like to emphasize about intermediality today is the method through which our knowledge of text was constructed. Therefore, this introduction is not just about reminiscing our individual and collective uh, journey to a connected past, but also realizing the shift in our mode of thinking about text as we looked for an Indian model <clears throat> to study the relationship between intermediality and literature. Like all university courses, we were distributed readings that were discussed in class, but our training also involved attending workshops, performances, musical recitations, plays, museums, and seminars organized by various institutions within and outside the city, which culminated in the different areas we found ourselves discovering. Our research scholars, expanded their understanding of comparative Indian literature by exploring topics like Ragmala paintings, Parsi theater, scroll painting narratives, campus theater, women's knowledge system in medieval India, mapping translations of the Bhagavad Gita, comparative study of Charita, Raso, and Nama, and many more exciting areas as a part of their MPhil and PhD research. We looked into iconography, performance, music, and studied their interrelationships with diverse traditions. My own journey consisted of this practice, and I can vouch that the experience has been truly enriching. Moving on now to the structure of our workshop. The workshop is divided into two days, where we have three keynote speakers presenting their ideas on the first day. Readings from each of the keynote speakers <clears throat> demonstrating their line of thought was circulated amongst speakers of the second day, keeping in mind the rationale of the workshop, which is to foster an understanding of intermediality that is interdisciplinary and multidimensional in its approach. We opened the workshop with our first keynote speaker, Professor Satyanath, presenting his paper, Visuality of Narration and Narration of Visuality. Our next keynote speaker, Dr. Katoni, approaches intermediality through the visual in her paper, Intermediality in the Understanding of Dave's Poetry. Our third speaker, Professor Doreswami, scholarship in Bhaktin and Film Theater Studies, informs her intermediate exploration of material culture in her paper titled, The Afterlife of the Buddha, Parinirvana Images in Eurasia. Our first group session will be chaired by Professor Balaji Ranganathan from the Center for Comparative Literature and Translation Studies, Central University of Gujarat. The three papers of this session engage with intermediality from their respective areas of interest. First, we have Niyati Shah's paper titled Intermediality and Autobiographical Constructions of Indian Theater Artists, followed by Ankita Datta's paper which is titled Transcultural and Transmediality of the Asian Nama Traditions, with special reference to the Hamza Nama from orality to audiovisuality. This is then followed by my paper, where I focus on three scroll painting narrative traditions and the idea of the text. The second group session is chaired by Professor Nishad Zaidi from the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia. The papers in this group focus on different forms of intermedial text, where we have Kanchi Jain's paper titled Construction of Focalization in Graphic Narratives with special focus on autobiographical novels. Anupriya in her paper titled Transmediality Narratology in Graphic Narratives explores Alison Bechdel's Fun Home. This is then followed by Sutir Thoroy's paper, Can the Non-Human Subaltern Speak? post-anthropocentric storytelling in animals. We have titled the final session as a roundtable discussion chaired by Professor Dore Swami, where we have two papers engaging with intermediality from diverse vantage points. Firstly, 
Sultan Zangmo's paper titled Media, the narrator of folklore and oral literature, emphasizes the role of media as preserver of oral culture in Ladakh. Then we have Fatima M. and Zara Sultan Muhammadi Talegani's paper titled Analyzing the Meanings of Ethics and Migration in Nilofar Demir's Photography, where they attempt to read the ethics of wars, migration, and representation in the pictures of Turkish photojournalist Nilofar Demir. This is followed by a final discussion where we invite all participants of the two-day workshop to bring their insights and comments on the various aspects of intermediality and future research prospects in this area. Having said this, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Durjati Sharma to introduce our group, Delhi Comparatives, to everyone. Durjati? Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nilza, for uh, introducing the workshop. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the Delhi Comparatives. Uh, Nilza had already talked about uh, the type of work. Uh, which is undertaken in the Department of Modern Indian Languages and Literary Studies, University of Delhi, for the last uh, one decade. So we can say the Delhi Comparatist is an uh, extension, or rather it has become a mainstay of those activities uh, uh, at the present moment. So uh, Delhi Comparatist uh, was a group uh, whose activities started almost a decade back, and the group uh, mainly consisted of uh, students and uh, teachers uh, from the Department of uh, Modern Indian Languages and Literary Studies, uh, University of Delhi. And uh, the primary focus of this group to begin with was uh, to engage itself uh, in comparative studies. And over a period of time, the scope, the scope of activities and its uh, uh, the perspectives on various matters, literary, cultural, historical expanded uh, in terms of its theoretical and uh, practical aspects. And through its uh, a decade long, almost it's been almost uh, more than a decade now, it has uh, the DC group, beginning with scholars and teachers from the department, has become a larger group of scholars now and uh, who have a like-minded vision on various aspects of literary and cultural studies. And the approach of this group, which is something I want to emphasize, and this is a direct connection with our workshop, is to emphasize on Indian literary culture as a pluralistic epistemology. This is something that uh, Professor Setanath will be emphasizing uh, uh, more clearly uh, in his uh, presentation. And the trust areas uh, with which uh, Delhi comparatists uh, have been engaged uh, for so long are the history and concept of uh, comparative Indian literature, theory, uh, multiple clusters of uh, intermediality, interliterariness, uh, literary historiography, gender, transmediality, uh, intermediality, like various kinds of medialities uh, uh, brought together, migration and border studies, uh, diaspora studies, digital humanities, electronic literature, uh, and the list goes on. And uh, of late, we have also introduced uh, areas like uh, translation and also uh, manuscriptology and also comparative folkloristics. So in terms of methodology, uh, what the members uh, of DC share are certain perspectives on the marginocentricism and social epistemology, something about which uh, Professor Satyanath will be uh, emphasizing very clearly in the course of his presentation. And also we, uh, rather than looking at uh, very literary textual approach we emphasize on the material aspects of literary studies and also uh, we aim to build we are doing that uh, to build a comprehensive and a very dense database and archive of uh, of very literary and cultural resources we already have built a repository and i'm happy to inform you that uh, we have a website uh, called www.delicomparatists.org where you can find all the information. So uh, since I've been given some time to talk about Delhi Comparatists, so I'd like to take this opportunity to talk a little more about our activities. Uh, we have a few research groups, forums, uh, which deal specifically with certain areas. Uh, 
The groups are uh, comparative uh, folklore studies, uh, rhetoric studies, literary historiography, intermediality studies, digital humanities, uh, diaspora and memory studies, COVID-19 cultural response, archiving and research forum, comparative manuscriptology and comparative literature in India. So uh, if you visit our website, you'll be able to, uh, uh, you'll find access to the information on all these groups. Uh, almost all these groups have undertaken various activities like uh, lectures and workshops and the information could be accessed uh, uh, through the website. If you go uh, to the different subgroups, you'll find information on, uh, you know, about what they are, they are intending to do. And also what are the activities they have under, undertaken, including YouTube links uh, to uh, various recordings of the events undertaken so far. And along with these research groups, uh, we have also undertaken a few projects like uh, which are allied to uh, these groups, uh, the COVID-19 Muslim Response Research and the COVID-19 a Cultural Research Book, a project which is currently underway. And also, as we said, we emphasize on building archives. So there's also a COVID-19 cultural response archive that is presently being constructed. And apart from that, uh, as I said, we are also emphasizing on translation as one of our core areas. So we have uh, two projects, uh, reception of Kaji Nazrul Islam in Indian literatures, and also multilingual translation of Kaji Nazrul Islam. The two projects are underway. And as uh, we all know that uh, the, the, the base uh, concept of our discipline is comparative literature. So we are also trying to build an archive of how comparative literature as a discipline has grown within the Indian context because above everything, we are also aiming to uh, build and consolidate an Indian school of comparative literature. And towards that end, we have uh, started uh, looking at the ways in which scholars uh, have within the Indian academia, how they have understood and conceptualized Indian literature, competitive literature, Indian literature and competitive Indian literature together as very allied disciplines and how they have uh, understood these disciplines and how they have, how various scholars across time and across space. I say this because when we talk about Indian academia, we don't talk about one central space. We talk about various nodes spread across the country, how they have responded to the discipline of competitive Indian literature in their own ways from the center and from the periphery. So this is a project that uh, we are trying to uh, build a competitive literature in India archive. So you are most welcome to visit our website to know more about uh, these projects. And then uh, uh, another important aspect of uh, Delhi Comparatist is that we have also uh, recently launched a journal called the Delhi Journal of Comparative Studies. And uh, it's uh, an online peer reviewed full text uh, biannual journal with open access in the field of comparative literature and cultural studies in their various forms in the Indian context. Now, the journal is, uh, is affiliated to the Delhi Comparatist. It has uh, the first issue is already out. It's available on the website and it has uh, uh, articles on the history and context of the discipline in the country, on theory, and all like the areas that uh, we have outlined on multiple clusters of interrelatedness, on literary historiography, gender, transmediality, translation, migration, and border studies. And uh, the aim of the journal is to foster newer and uh, you know, more nuanced uh, critical thinking on the discipline of cultural studies. Uh, the first issue is already out. Uh, I'll quickly uh, uh, read out uh, the articles which have found place. Actually, in the first issue, uh, we have actually brought together, compiled uh, articles from uh, the scholars of yesteryears who have contributed uh, meaningfully to the area of competitive literature. So we have, uh, uh, we have compiled uh, articles from uh, written by Professor Ravindra Kumar Das Gupta, uh, from Professor by Sishir, Professor Sishir Kumar Das, uh, by Dr. Indira Goswami, uh, by Professor uh, Robert Antoine, uh, uh, by Professor Indira Patrasarathy, 
and also from Dr. Uh, Mitra Mukherjee Parikh. So the articles actually are wide ranging, they encompass, uh, you know, the classic from classical tradition, from Greek tragedy and Sanskrit drama to uh, early British Orientalism, uh, moving into the various vernacular literary cultural traditions of India. It talks about, they talk about the Ramayana. So they, there, as you, could, as you could see that even the articles which have found place in uh, the first issue of Delhi Comparatist, uh, DCJS, Delhi, Compar Delhi Comparative Journal of Competitive Studies, it, uh, you know, it has its own character of intermediality. So you're most welcome to go through it. And uh, apart from that, we are also uh, building a very strong social media network. We are available on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So you'd email anyone interested in our activities may like to get in touch with us through our social media networks. So I guess I have spoken enough on uh, the various activities of daily comparatives. So uh, to begin with, I'd like to uh, offer my best wishes uh, to Nilsa uh, for the forthcoming two days of the workshop. So uh, that's all from uh, my side. So over to you, Nilza, for the further proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dujati Sarma, for introducing uh, DC so beautifully. Um, we'll like uh, to proceed with the <clears throat> talk now. Um, I'll first introduce uh, Professor Satyanath to everyone. Um, it is really an honor to be doing this. Um, Professor T.S. Satyanath, is a former professor of comparative Indian literature and Kannada at the Department of Modern Indian Languages and Literary Studies, University of Delhi. Comparative literature, translation studies, and folklore studies are his areas of interest. He is an executive member of the Comparative Literature Association of India and one of the editors of the Delhi Journal of Comparative Studies. So, sir, if you're ready, would you like to take over? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, sir. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I, before I begin, I would like to thank Amitava and Nilja for organizing this workshop, which has actually provided an opportunity to pick, put people together not only within India, but also from abroad. Uh, this, I hope, you know, this will be the beginning of a series of workshops, roundtables, seminars that daily comparatives are going to organize in, uh, in due course on various topics of their interest. And um, let me talk um, for a few minutes as to how I got into uh, transmediality. See, as a person who was teaching comparative literature courses in the department, um, I, I had an opportunity to design and start many of the courses that have become a, a standard uh, course in most of the comparative literature departments today. For example, when I started teaching bhakti, there wasn't anything, um, I mean, not even a body of texts were available. So the, in 1994, I put together about 50 poems, which I picked up from various uh, translations that had been done, starting from Ramanujan and others, and typed them on, a, uh, on my computer and circulated that as the material. But things changed soon. And in order to make this process of understanding bhakti, which did not exist in a script form for till 19th century, or till the print media appeared on the scene. Of course, we have a man medieval manuscript tradition of bhakti compositions in different Indian languages, in some languages, but rather than as a text, they have they existed or they have been in use for a long time in a performative format, either through singing or sometimes even through performance. 
and some of those issues I'm going to bring in. And it is this that made me look at uh, Indian literature, understanding Indian literature uh, cannot be done mechanically uh, in the textbook manner in which we learn these things. Uh, you know, secondly, inter-art studies in comparative literature and uh, transmediality or intermediality in media studies was, was there for quite some time, and particularly ever since Roman Jakobson talked of intersemiotic translation. And, but that needs, that for me, it was very important to understand those discussions in the Indian context, uh, particularly the areas that I was uh, trying to touch upon. And unfortunately, we don't have histories of many disciplines. Let me start from that. We don't have a history in India. It was started sometime towards the late, uh, I mid the 19th century or so. And we, do, we did not have a geography. Uh, despite our medieval mariners or the sailors sailed all over the Indian Ocean without a box extent and without a compass. So there were and so fortunately, and we also did not have a translation per se. We were asked to follow a trajectory of translation of original and uh, translated text, fidelity, whatever gap, whatever you call it. So in fact, when we got exposed to comparative literature, it was a series of fresh learnings that we were supposed to do. But fortunately, we had a very fascinating history of transmediality or intermediality in medieval India. So unlike other, other things, which were also important terms in the history of uh, the comparative literature as a discipline, for example, in the 1990s, we hear about a spatial term. We hear about a cultural term. We hear about an intermediate term and we hear about a translational term because it's unless the Berlin Wall hadn't been broken and unless the Soviet Union had not been disintegrated and the European Union hadn't come into existence, I don't think translation studies would have gotten the type of importance that it got during this, in the last 20 years within India. So, but however, we, despite we have a medieval intermediality, we, we normally don't uh, study intermediality as a, as an, with an emphasis as a special area of comparative literature. We recently graphic novels and a variety of other things have come into the picture, but they have come from a different trajectory. We have, we have not looked at them within the perspective of continuation of medieval Indian intermediality. That was the second thing. So it, I think, you know, in my own uh, personal uh, experience, somewhere around 2000, um, or a little before, we started a series of studies on translations. And as a person who was seriously interested in medieval Indian literature, my, some of my early writings in, in translation studies looked into this aspect of what, what does it mean to say there is a medieval, medieval Indian translation. So it's, I, I wrote a series of papers and many of those papers involved some amount of looking at music or some amount of looking at pictoriality. And it is these components which took me towards intermediality. So hence, at, soon after that, around 2005 or so, you know, I, I proposed a sort of a, uh, a heuristic device of understanding uh, Indian medieval Indian representation in terms of a uh, scriptocentric, phonocentric, and body centric representations, which roughly corresponds to text centered, orality centered, 
and the performativity center representations. And then a series of uh, things are associated with it. They have a structure of their own. Uh, if I can go to the PowerPoint presentation and if I get, a, get time, I will go into those things. Otherwise, probably if, if time is left at the end, remind me and come back and question me, I might be able to get back to these things. So with the, this, this background, let me get into the representation. A small um, uh, calamity has happened. I was working on my Mac, which doesn't have electricity, and the electricity suddenly went off, and it hasn't come yet. So I have moved whatever material I have to other computer, and there is some uh, uh, battery backup uh, system that you, the UPS system we have, and you know, let us, so you know, the, the, the PPT that was supposed to be there <laughs> is, uh, really not there. So let me share the screen. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So, you know, I, I was talking of uh, uh, scriptocentric, phonocentric, and body centric uh, systems, and uh, the schema that I have proposed still somehow, somewhere, subsumes that it is the text that is going to be expanded or text that is going to move into orality and into performativity. Uh, this is a consequence of a dominant scriptocentric anchoring that is there uh, as a part and parcel of comparative literary studies. So many of those discussions that I do today the figures that I show gets contested towards the end and probably would also try to create a little bit of an opening into the uh, present, uh, our thinking or the thinking uh, that I have been trying to do. I have a brief uh, overview, although this whole thing is not uh, being uh, uh, meticulously followed, but I will give you a uh, a brief outline. Let me start uh, with a brief introduction on intermediality, which I have already done, so I may not go back to that. And I have also briefly talked about intermediality in medieval Indian literary culture, but I will go to that again when I go to those figures. And then three important topics that I have been uh, talking about, and also is, is part of the circulated material that I have uh, given, the paper that you people have seen is the scriptocentric, phonocentric, and the body centric representations. And then briefly, I will uh, uh, talk about the autonomy of the directionality of flow that is actually contesting a linear, apparently looking linear model from scriptocentric to phonocentric to body centric. If you see the figure, you know, you feel that, you know. Um, but this autonomy. Uh, the, the autonomy of each of these uh, scriptocentric, phonocentric, and body centric representations and the direction of the flow could be from uh, any one of them into the other. So that, that's where the intermedial, uh, the, the term intermedial gets into the discussion. <coughs> then I will take one or two cases to talk about that. Um, then towards the end, I take up the issue of uh, how do we read a visuality? And or I will try to go back and map how visuality or performativity is being read by culture. And is there a model that we can construct to understand that? Uh, okay. 
I will skip off uh, all introduction and let me go into the um, this. This is actually uh, the text in India, if it is a scriptocentric format. Be before that, let me just go and come back. Okay, this is the model that uh, I have proposed. Uh, this is this almost 15 years back, and that's where you see um, the linearity. Uh, the arrow at the bottom says, says gradually increase, increasing reach. Uh, that was presuming a, a, a public sphere, a public sphere which varies uh, as the text moves from uh, uh, text moves into recitation and then into to, into performative and then into sculptural, purely visual world. So let me go back again into this uh, one to start with. So the the text normally well, text means uh, we shouldn't think of a printed text of a medieval uh, Ramcharitmanas or uh, uh, the Kritivasa Ramayana or uh, Madhava Kandali's text or whatever it is. We should think of a manuscript in which uh, it was uh, uh, located before uh, textual criticism um, uh, dealt with it. Uh, I would say, to use a stronger word, mutilated the format of the text and produced a text which did not, which doesn't have recensions, which doesn't have commentary, which doesn't have several other things. So, a, a text normally had uh, a poem or a verse or a sutra. Uh, as text, medieval texts were in South India were Jain and uh, or uh, Buddhist they were uh, normally used to be in the language of Sanskrit and Prakrit. The words or sutra, words means there is a poem. For example, if you look at Srila uh, Padigaram, it, it, is, it says, Madala Vadigatai, that means first gatha. You know, it's, gatha must have been a poem there, or uh, like in Gatha Satasai, or uh, any of the Jaina texts starts with a gatha, a, a referential poem or a synoptic verse which deals with a story in Prakrit and in a formulaic uh, format. It's, it's like an abstract of a, of, a, of a paper. And that will actually, because it's a historical text, it, that if soon after the verse, there will be an un, uh, anvaya. Anvaya means verbatim uh, interpretation. Um, you, you will notice that the Anvaya could be in Sanskrit, Prakrit, or vernacular. In most of the cases, it will be in vernacular. So there is a vernacular lexicon coming here. The dictionary is already there. And then you have Etatparya, which is actually a summary of the, of the sutra or the verse after the, according to the Anvaya. So there is a lexicon coming and there is a process of translation setting in here you know the it it provides a summary this is an inter or intralingual translation what uh, Roman Copson called from one 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 stage of the language to the other stage of the language uh, if it is in the same language if it is not in the same language for example the the Jaina Prakrit text getting translate uh, getting its uh, or summary being rendered in in Kannada, then it's already a translation. And then you have the Lakshana. You know, the, if it's a grammar, it is the Lakshana, which are the poems, uh, which are examples to the Sutra, or the in, in certain cases, the Lakshana, in place of Lakshana, you know, there are, there might, several stories might appear. You know, for example, if you look at a hagiography of uh, Gorak or someone, what happens is stories gets added, the parallel stories. You know, one of the words that has been used is to say branch stories. So, you know, like a tree, the stories gets added to that. So, thereby, there is another, uh, uh, it's, that means it's, it, this, this single story narration is getting converted into a sort of an anthology of stories related with a particular thing. That's how, you know, they branch out, you know, for example, the uh, Paula Richman called the uh, Shilapadigaram, the Tam, early Tamil Kavya as actually branch stories, Buddhist logic and branch stories. And then below that, 
is a tika. So when it is uh, when a tika is written, tika is normally written in I in a contemporary language, or when I think when one when the tradition start thinking that the language the original language of the original words, whether it is Sanskrit or vernacular itself, is not it is not difficult to understand. Tikas are also signifiers of a confusion within the system, or rather than confusion, disagreement sometimes. Many tikas don't have to be an expansion of this, the the verse or sutra at all. So in that sense, the manuscript it's it's dead for all practical purposes and is in a museum. It's a very vibrant discursive discourse of medieval India. See, come to the left. At one end. The, the sutra or the verse in its original format could be read by a person who knows Sanskrit Prakrit or the ancient form of vernacular in a, in, a, in a monastery or in a court or somewhere where it's in an elite setting. So the, so the, the public sphere is also changing. Whereas when you come to, towards tika, it is ordinary. You know, tika is always done for the sake of the contemporary um, uh, audience who are not able to understand the language that is there in the original. So a text itself is highly dynamic. And let me just briefly go into the next. Uh, so it is within this, uh, what I, the, all the explanation that I gave is for the first uh, block, which I, which I call text. Uh, I, I was talking of a, uh, a text only for one verse, but this text is to start with. If in most of the, uh, not in most of the, see, uh, there is an, there is a need for another. You know, in uh, in at least half a dozen Indian languages, the history of literature starts with a scriptocentric writing system. In the rest of the languages. Uh, mostly in uh, North Indian languages, Marathi, Malayalam, their history starts with actually a phonocentric tradition of bhakti poems. So, the so if we uh, take a typology of uh, religious literature in India, including the secular, because religious and secular are uh, um, uh, uh, related by an umbilical cord. A very uh, if there is a, uh, a question or something, I'll try to explain that uh, later. Um, otherwise, you have the Buddhist literature, Pali, Prakrit, Sanskrit. You have the Jaina literature, again Prakrit, Shurseni, Vagera, Vagera, and Tamil, Kannada, Gujarati, Marathi, and to some extent in Hindi. You have Bhakti literature in most of the Indian languages. And then you have a Persian public sphere where you know you have some Persian influence and uh, the, the new languages and varieties emerging and also writing in Persian and Arabic, you know, within the um, Sultan, Delhi Sultanate and the Deccani Sultanate courts. And then you have uh, uh, the modernity coming in. So each one of them generate a particular type of uh, public sphere activity and uh, media. So that is the text I was talking of. So for the scriptocentric text, um, which is the, the, the most of the Buddhist Jaina and uh, the early part of Tamil and Kannada literature, the the re, its reading is exclusively either in the court or in the home. So you know, it's a sort of a reader-oriented activity which is done at home. So it doesn't have any elaborate. It can also be done individually. For example, even now, most of the texts like Tulsi Raman and other things are recited in traditional homes after the morning worship is over. And that doesn't have any music, raga, or something like that. That's just a, a, a long narration. But when the same text moves into the recitation tradition, which it moves into the temple, or Namagar or something of that sort, you have a gathering of listeners. That is where the interpretative uh, thing that I talked of in the previous uh, textual frame comes into picture. But here it doesn't, uh, so in, in South India, that is called as the Gamaka Vachana tradition. The texts are melodiously recited to the various ragas of Carnatic music, of course. 
and then they are also interpreted there is an interpretation that is involved in it because the language has become archaic or, or the public sphere that is there within the temple or the monastery is not able to understand the language so there is an inter one when the music gets into that there is already another epistemology that is the epistemology of music and the social epistemology that is associated with it you know that means music has a system it is a raga system it has ragas and raginis there is a family concept it has actually a temporal uh, a cycle of the day which part of the day it needs to be sung and it also has a seasonal aspect that means the the which part of the year the particular raga should be sung and all those details are embedded into that and but in any case this format of music or this format of text is which i call the phonocentric is not completely available to the entire society so we move into the open which is the audience oriented and the performance oriented where it's like a yakshagana folk play where anyone who is associated with the society there is a hierarchy still the maybe the dominant caste sit close to the stage and uh, the the marginal caste sit uh, somewhere towards the end uh, there could be a segregation women women may, may, may be allowed into some of them they may not be allowed again this is a set of a social epistemology that gets into the uh, performance or the body centric tradition at the same time both music and performance or have their own social epistemologies of other time they belong to the, the, they are the monopolistic uh, tenden, uh, professions of different castes and they, they cannot be easily confiscated and uh, encroached into their domain so you know that's that's another area so what i i was i'm trying to suggest is um intermediality in india is not just a formalistic epistemology it is also a social epistemology and then you go to sculpture for example if there is a, an episode from ramayana and it is depicted on the sculpture in a in the form of a painting then there is a relationship that means the text is now into a sculptural form it may not it may have text as i will subsequently demonstrate or it may not have text at all but still based on the see uh, the entire episode is while in the uh, which is about 20 pages which is in the form of sandhis uh, that means virtually joints you know you should see how the kavya structure itself is organized you know it is put into uh, sandhis parvas you know the, these are it it what really looks like a branch a branching tree and then connected to the stem that will be the so in in any case the whole text is not narrated entire text only an episode is recited in the home uh, environment an episode is recited in the temple too it is sung and an episode is performed in the open uh, uh, a theater as a as a folk play and a similar episode goes into the wall of the temple it might have even a single one where you know you will find uh, shiva or mahishasura marjani which is narrating an entire story in the form in an action form that is the most crucial form of the visuality is captured in that and based on our knowledge and versions of the iconography and the story behind that we may we will try to reconstruct a story for ourselves and it is here that the dominancy or the alternative alternative reading of a visuality starts and is possible you know, i'll i'll go back to it uh, subsequently so if i put and I try to understand the discussion that i have done in terms of a um, in terms of a public sphere for example in the previous one i suggested that it's a gradually increasing public sphere that means i'm looking at from the point of view of text text is expanding in the tamaka vachana tradition to a bigger audience 
and be expanding further into in the yakshagana into a still bigger audience and in the forum for sculpture it's open to everyone and it's actually the when you are visualizing a sculpture you are trying to do an intertextuality of the variety of stories that you have heard about uh, varieties of versions of the story that you have you have been familiar so i i i tried to understand it as a gradually increasing reach but you know that might get affected and you can still think of an alternative way of uh, moving from visuality to narrativity that is the uh, material uh, item that i am going to go towards the end in this one you see i have put four concentric circles which are touching each other and the text at home is cryptocentric the recitation at temple is phonocentric folk theater is much more open which is body centric and then the sculpture and painting is at the cognitive level and is at intertextual so the type of uh, uh, the uh, reach that the different intermediate intermediaries that i am trying to differentiate is a variable one and alternatively we can also see and imagine an interaction within a literary culture between the scriptocentric manuscript tradition body centric performative tradition and the phonocentric orality tradition they there is a possibility and for some of them we definitely have strong evidence to show that an interaction of this sort is possible now let me see how how do i let me try to demonstrate how do i connect the three systems uh, three subsystem that means the textual tradition the recitation tradition which involves orality and the performative tradition which includes body centricity so i used i have used the same uh, uh, schema here you know the sutra or the text anvaya which is verbatim tatparya summary lakshana examples or something tika the interpretative or the translation tradition if you go to the recitation tradition these the the sutra or the aphorism or text is represented by a small suchana padya padya is poem small poem sometimes even a half verse which actually tells what happens in the episode and then the episode starts so the the this the sutra or the aphorism aphorism this is something similar, similar to a gatha for example a, a, a gatha of a jaina saint or a gatha of a jaina muni or a gatha is normally given in the beginning before the story starts they are called as aradhana stories that means worship stories reciting the lives of the great saints now if that gets into um, when when that moves into the recitation tradition that means when it is recited in the public then you know the music has come into that once i i already said that when once when the music comes music is a parallel as parallel a development as literary tradition is in medieval india for example if uh, if we if we start seeing literary text appearing around uh, um, if we leave uh, uh, ashwaghosha and bhasa for a different kind of example for example kalidasa is the uh, sanskrit canonical uh, important writer um uh, and within 2 3 centuries the music text starts appearing um 8th 9th century you know uh, 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 you know it's a systematic uh, uh, way of uh, looking uh, at uh, vernacular 
cosmopolitan writing system. That means the continuation of the Sanskrit vernacular, Sanskrit cosmopolitan system in regional languages. The, the, there are disagreements with Tamil, but Tamil dates, uh, people debate. For example, if you read Sheldon Pollock, Sheldon Pollock doesn't think that Tamil cosmopolitan, vernacular cosmopolitanism started uh, till the uh, 10th, 11th century. So, you know, we will see around, around 7th, 8th century, the, the, the cosmopolitanism starts, and around the same time, the musical text also starts. Brahadeshi is about 8th, 9th, 10th uh, century in its time, you know, but there are uh, texts which can be predated to. Um, but what is very important is by the time the recitation system gets established, fairly well established, that means when the when kavyas in vernacular languages and bhakti starts appearing, there's a proliferation of music text. So the appearance of the music text, the appearance of medieval, uh, another important uh, no, medieval bhakti literature, it's around the 12th, 13th, 14th century, it starts, but by about 13th, 14th century, in most of the Indian languages, you have you have bhakti poem and they are sing and performed. And it's around the same time that's another important uh, genre appears, which is which are ragmala paintings, which actually link literature. If you see a ragmala painting, you have a script there on it. It's scripto-centric. You have uh, uh, body-centric because it's the picturization. It is said normally said that you, when you listen to a uh, when you look at uh, a ragmala ledger uh, folio you normally listen to the music that is being played at the background someone would pay them play the music so you know that's it. so and this it is not a strange coincidence that all these things these three things appear in bhakti so that's where and within a within a short period you know so that's what what it is what uh, recitation is doing is in this uh, if i look at the extreme left one it it is providing a vyakhyana. Vyakhyana means interpretation of the of the kavya that is being rendered in uh, uh, with music. And towards the right, I have the uh, dialogue. Uh, again, you know, you, you have the Purvaranga here, that is the earlier part of the ritual, which were in, including the Sanskrit drama has this Purvaranga part of it. And then instead of all these interpretative things that uh, is Anvaya and Tatparya, you have acting, costume, and music coming there. And the dialogues actually provide the Tika counterpart of that. So let me uh, end all this discussion here and uh, suggest a possibility of taking an alternative trajectory. So, so far, you know, my discussion centers around the fact that there is a core text. And this core text I have tried to explain that in terms of the medieval Indian repertoire that we had, the phonotic, uh, the scriptocentric, phonocentric, and the body-centric systems. But could these things be autonomous? That means we, at, I have at least uh, one or two papers where I have demonstrated that the pictorial tradition, that means the sculptural traditions, uh, followed an altogether different version of the story than we are familiar with the scriptocentric system. That means, for example, if I uh, want to make it very specific, if you have a story from Mahabharata, and in this case, the Kiratarjuniya story, this somehow, we, we have, a, first of all, uh, Kiratarjuniya episode appe appears to be not um, quote and unquote original uh, to the, the quote and unquote Vyasa Mahabharata. It appears somewhere at a later date, uh, maybe around more or less around the same time as Bharavi wrote Kirat Arjuniya in the 8th, 9th century. Um, and they all, scholars also say either that was written in the Ganga court in Karnataka or in the Pallava court in in uh, Kanchipuram. So it's a, it's a, the text belongs to a different tradition and it is found in the South Indian recensions and then, you know, there are not many instances of uh, Kiratarjuniya episode 
in the sculptural representations from North India. In the, on the, that means on the temple wall, this don't have to be. There are not many structures left. Not alleging anyone for this. It could be even to the ignorance and the carelessness of the sustaining community. Uh, but <clears throat> but in South India, you have a lot of Kirata Junya episodes, particularly coming from the region of what today we call as Karnataka, but medievally could be called as from the Deccan region. And it is it spans from 740, the earliest evidence, up to 18th, 19th century, from sculpture into painting and in, in, in a variety of formats, retaining a particular type of story that is not central to both to Bharavi and Mahabharata. In the sense, I don't have a picture, so you know, let me uh, <coughs> let me uh, try to conclude that as early. In that uh, episode, what uh, happens is in the pictorial, that means in the sculptural version, which comes from earliest uh, example of uh, Ihula and Patikal in Karnataka, which is actually the capital of the early Badami Chalukyas, uh, around 740. The Arjuna is not defeated by Shiva. It is Ar Arjuna rather defeats Shiva and has put Shiva on the floor and trying to deliver a blow. I, unfortunately, I don't have that visual, otherwise I, have, I had. So, you know, those of you who are interested, I have a paper on that, you know, you can take a look at that. But how did this story come? You know, it, it, this could be noticed in the, in the scriptocentric, phonocentric and the bodycentric versions within the Karnataka region. In Pampas Adipurana, which is one of the earliest texts, 930 approximately, uh, CE, uh, Pampa doesn't say that yeah, Pampa is a Jain. So early scholars said, that as he's a Jain, he is not uh, showing reverence to Shiva. So this could be one of the strategies that Jain has adapted, but that's not true. You know, there, there was an alternative tradition. Pampa says, um, Arjuna put Shiva on the floor and pressed his throat from his uh, toe. Very sacrilegious looking act. Um, then, you know, you have a variety of folk versions where and Sthala Puranas associated with various places where you still have this version and it's around 13th, 14th century with a composition of the Brahminical Mahabharata in Canada by Kumaravyasa, which is one of the, like uh, Pampa, like Pampa is of the Jaina Mahabharata. Jaina Mahabharata is not Mahabharata. It is called Vikramarjuna Vijaya. It is Arjuna's story. This is Karnataka Bharata Katamanjari or uh, Kumaravyasa Bharata. This is Brahminical and it is there that we start seeing the Bharavi story continuing. That means it is the, Arjuna is defeated by Shiva. And in the in in painting and sculpture, painting appears only after a particular time. In this earliest thought the sculptural, and there are about uh, 30, 25 to 30 sculptures which have been studied by Nagarajara, and I have used that material extensively in my paper. There, it's consistently Shiva is being defeated by Arjuna, and the story goes that. Arjuna once talks about an auspicious mark on the shoulder of Arjuna. Sorry, Shiva uh, talks about the auspicious marks on Arjuna's shoulder to Parvati and Parvati wants to see it. So he brings her and gets engaged into a fight with uh, uh, Arjuna as a, as, a, as a disguised as a kirata, as a hunter. So in most of these painting, Parvati is huntress, Shiva is a hunter, and then there is a baby that uh, she is carrying, definitely not uh, Ganesh or uh, Ganesha, but it appears to be Kumara. Um, and then there, there is a retinue of dogs and a variety of other things. So that's a different world. So here are the uh, possibilities that a system a Canada system 
might have multiple varieties, multiple versions of the story traveling in th these three important uh, medial conduits. And there could also be an interaction among them. Uh, in order to make that uh, point clear, let me just uh, read a few, um, a few slides about uh, the discussion uh, that helps in understanding the figures that I have showed so far. The nature of relationship between form and content, why, why is it uh, important? I'm taking up an issue. The nature of relationship between form and content plays a crucial role in the understanding of intermediality. The ideas of Russian formalism on the one hand and Jacobson concepts of intersemiotic translation on the other strongly advocated a scientific method for studying poetic language keeping form as central and favor an intrinsic approach. It also pleaded for the exclusion of traditional psychological and cultural historical approaches, that is, that is the extrinsic approach. Accordingly, the stretch in intra studies and intermediate studies was the art and accordingly, the marginalization or the exclusion of social epistemology. At the same time, as an outcome of formalism, formalistic principles play an important role and accordingly, mediality, the formal aspect of representation gets privilege and over cultural aspects. Uh, I, I, have I have told this, the scholars in humanity speak of a quantitative turn in history, so I will skip that. While meaning is external to the form in the European theory of meaning, the, you know, the, in linguistics, the semantics is always external to the three building blocks of phonetic, phonology, morphology, and syntax, which yield into each other. And it is through via the lexicon that the meaning is brought in. And um, uh, this, 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 is, this is actually, this has created a problem for a variety of understandings, including the uh, artificial intelligence where uh, a, a dictionary is, uh, is created to get the meaning from that. And let us not go into that. While the meaning is external, external to the form in the European theory of meaning, the two are fused into each other in the Indian uh, system of meaning, walk, forum, and artha meaning, are fused co to constitute vagartha, in an analogy of a divine couple of the divine couple Parvati and Parameshwara, this is Kalidasa's Vagartha Viva Sampratha, an androgenic form, Ardhanarishwara. This is a radically different way of conceptualizing the relationship between form and meaning and has significant implications for the construction and interpretation of intermediality. While the European way of conceiving form and meaning relationship treats them as separable, the Indian way treats them as inseparable. This is also while the print culture has brought in a paradigmatic shift in the production of consumption, production and consumption of literary forms in Europe, several medieval Indian intermediate forms are still alive and continue to exist among us. Hence, we still have sensibilities intact for Indian medieval representations. At the construction and sustenance level, we, we, we have seen at the conception and sustenance level, we can further notice that not only is cryptocentric, phonocentric, and body centric representation overlap with each other, but also the social and epistem social epistemologies are also fused into artistic representations. Uh, this is the, uh, the shows that such a fusion. Now, in order to show that the story might come from somewhere from outside, that means uh, the, the text need not have to be central to the tradition, uh, that means textual tradition. I talked about uh, the other case. Here is another case. Uh, let me look at the time. Uh, I'm supposed to end at what time? Uh, so you have time uh, till 30 maybe? Oh no, then you know, I will let me uh, briefly go through this and go to the last portion. Okay, 
what i have used is i have used the story of uh, narayana bhatta from durga simhas panchatantra story of narayana bhatta is narayana bhatta takes a pilgrimage and then you know a, a thief wants to accompany him and cheat him he hides the gold that is required for the expenses in a staff in the hollowness of in the hollow of the staff that he carries in his hand and then the thief knows this so he follows that and then you know tries to, in between the incidents takes place there are four incidences and then he is uh, he steals the um, staff and gets caught and then the consequence and that is the representation the interesting thing is this story is not there in any of the panchatantras that has been found so far i mean vishnu sharma and vasubhaga's uh, two important tradition uh, vasubhaga is the jain tradition and vishnu sharma is the brahmanical tradition the two are not have not been found and the earliest text available is the kannada version of durga simhas panchatantra and in this follows actually vasubhaga's version which is a jaina version as we don't know whether uh, other translations of vasubhaga's tradition that has gone from south india um, which is available in southeast asia they don't have this story so this story is a unique story which is a part and parcel of the panchatantra corpus and which doesn't belong to them so there are two such stories the story of the jackal and the story of narayan bhatta are found only in the kannada version of durga simha none of the other panchatantras carry these two stories however they have been depicted as sculptural versions we have a lot of sculptural versions at least two i have i'm producing here interestingly these two versions that i'm talking of um they come from a pre durga simha day they come they are they are they were sculpted um uh, during the rashtrakuta regime somewhere around the 8th 9th century so but they can one of them contain a small verse which is a verse in sanskrit which is produced in uh, uh, durga simha but in a with a slight deviation so this actual what i'm trying to suggest is i'm trying to suggest possibility of multiple traditions and the possibility of a tradition that is there subsequently entering the literary uh, version or the or that means the the episodes or the narratives from the phonocentric and the body centric uh, traditions becoming a part of the scriptocentric tradition uh, that the reverse uh, trajectory uh, so the ultimately it goes to the king uh, i will explain i'm i'm not going to explain the whole thing because i want to save time for the other thing the king I, he, this is towards the end of the story the king asked narayan bhatta what he meant by that verse the verse that i'm going to read then narayan bhatta narrated the incidents of the blindfold lady breastfeeding her baby of durta shikamani cheat who did not steal a piece of grass but took away the staff containing gold of the heron heron giving religious discourse and eating the fish which attended uh, that attended uh, the discourse of the thief and of the thief who was in the grab of an asset the king searched the cave and uh, that the thief and uh, uh, and found several articles stolen from the town he punished the thief and rewarded narayana bhatta with great wealth this is the balachumbita naricha trinashyorascha brahmana dharmam karoti shakuni tapaso nasti sanchaya undoubtedly he is the one and instead of tapaso in durga simha there is a kshapana ko that means kshapana the which, which is another term for the same thing so in the 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 this and, and also secondly we should notice that this durga simhas panchatantra is a kannada panchatantra but there is still a sanskrit words there so you know the, this is another aspect i'm not going the words in the picture below from the panel from museum alampur in alampur is in andhra pradesh from the is similar to the one found in durga simhas panchatantra except that instead of tapaso the word kshapanaka mendicant 
appears in the inscription at Swarga Brahma Temple, Alampur, and the sculptural panel at the Museum, Alampur. There are two of them. This is the uh, um, inscription. But this inscription appears differently. These are the four panels, the lady feeding the child, the, 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 the thief stealing away the uh, bamboo staff, and the, the um, heron delivering this course, and the kshapanaka being hung from, the, from top uh, as a punishment. And above all of these things, the, the where I have put the cursor, the, the po portion of the uh, poem has been inscribed. Uh, whereas this is the full poem that exists on the, on the other, uh, at, at other place. You, I have enlarged them in a slightly better manner. You can see all the four of them here. Uh, the time is around 696, seventh century. The episodes of this story are de depicted and they let me not go into the details. Yeah, this is the other one. It is not very clear, but you know, here the representation is totally different in a different format. It is the same Alampur, you know, the, this is in the Alampur Museum and we believe that uh, uh, that it, the sculptural, uh, sculptural piece must have been formed from the same temple. The narration is the the narration technique between the the the, the temple uh, pedestal uh, one and the one the panel that is found are uh, is radically different. The the point that I am trying to make here is to show it's quite possible that there could be a different directionality of reading medieval transmediality, not using the scriptocentric model, but using the phonocentric and the uh, body-centric uh, 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 you know, models of uh, approaching uh, a text or you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, let me just, uh, okay, fine. Let me briefly go through. I would like to now uh, touch two things. One of them is an author sectarian performative tradition and a, and a Sufi representation of a painting. And I would like to do a synthesis to see whether we can think of a model to understand the narrativity of visual, uh, narrativity and visuality in medieval Indian culture. As a contrast to viewing the culture in a model of binary opposition, implying a power relation of high and low and um, sustenance and loss, living versus dead, an alternative model of viewing culture as change and continuity and as a continually evolving system has been used here. Accordingly, we have several versions of Arjuna's pilgrimage coming from scriptocentric phonocentric and body centric representations. I have cut a lot of things, so let me just tell you. I'm talking of a system called, uh, 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 rather a performative tradition called the Kinnari Jogi tradition. And the Kinnari Jogis perform a variety of Mahabharata, but this is again centered around Arjuna as a Jogi. Arjuna as a Jogi for, goes for pilgrimage, marries uh, women, his queens, and then come back. And uh, this is linked to the Natha sectarian tradition because the tradition believes that Arjuna is the primordial Natha Jogi and is a student of uh, uh, Matsendra. Uh, again, the Matsendra Gorak relationship comes in there. Some traditions believe that Shiva is the primordial Jogi. Some traditions believe that uh, Arjuna is the primordial Jogi. And the the pilgrimage portion of the Arjuna's uh, uh, Mahabharata episode is linked to that and it, it is transformed into the... And there are a variety of uh, tradition appearing. Uh, it's, it's basically a performative tradition, but there are also script. I would be dealing with a with Kinnari Jogi, a chop book version, Kinnari Jogi tradition in, of performance, a chop book version, and a tamburi. Tamburi is something like a ektari in Canada, there is a tradition of that. 
the details cannot be produced. Uh, this is the Nanjana Gudu Pandita, Nanjunda Pandita's uh, Giliya Hadu Matu, Arjuna Jogi Hadu, which is the parrot song and Arjuna Jogi song. Uh, the multiple communities for which I will I'll, uh, skip all those things. Let me just uh, go further. Uh, and what happens in this text is somewhere towards the um, third, the, it's in four cantos, somewhere towards the end of the third canto, Arjuna Jogi enters uh, um, a Muslim settlement. This is very important uh, in uh, Deccan and in many parts of India because uh, Deccan and North India lived a composite uh, culture for a very long time. So hence, elements from uh, Natha sectarian uh, 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 narratives get into the, the Sufi and vice versa, the commonalities, overlapping systems, performers being the same, Sufis and uh, uh, Natha sectarian yogis meeting each other, going to Kankas. And there, there is a, uh, or, you know, compositions in a mixed long. And here, that is what happens. As soon as Jogi gets in, the long way switches to Dekhni. And the, and, and the next three or four poems will be in, in Dekhni. Similarly, when he goes into the uh, merchant settlements, it transforms into Telugu. So here is a Kannada folk, folk epic in which uh, the stanzas or the portions of the epic changes its long way. In addition to that, um, there is a sometime, so, so you know, let us say there is a Kinari Jogi tradition, which is performed even today, a 15 hour long epic. And then there is a chop book version. And then someone rendered this chop book, a, a folk performer renders this chop book, chop book version into a cassette version. You know, now it is getting the electronic media and into a, a, a different format. And when when this but this is being done within in a region where Deccani is not very popular, this is in the southern part of uh, Karnataka. So what happens here is, as soon as he sings this portion in Deccani, there is a new interpreter. He interprets it in the local language. So there is another translation. And the text is constantly changing, and uh, and, and uh, so what I was trying to suggest from all these things is that this is what is happening. There are multilingualities and translation associated with a single uh, episode, and they are coming from multiple directions making use of multiple social epistemologies uh -huh. here, you know, uh, trans intermediality is uh, totally a different thing. It is getting from print to text, text into cassette, cassette into now, you know, all of them are on the internet. So there is another, that is one transformation. But from the point of view for that other thing, it is mixing the traditions. For example, the music that is used in the chop book version. Chop book version is written in a form, metrical structure called Sangatya, a four line meter. Whereas most of the folk performances are sung in, in Tripadi, which is a three line meter. It is difficult to fit the rhythmic structure and the, uh, and the matra structure, syllabic structure of of a Sangatya into a Tripadi singing format. But you know, these singers are miraculously experts in mixing and uh, taming such non-tameable entity. So in this figure, what I have done is, um, see, the, in the first one, there is a peripatetic uh, Kinari Yogis, which gets into the Chabuk version in the second, which gets into the cassette version, uh, which, which gets into the local tradition of the southern part of Karnataka, which I call the Tamburi tradition, which gets into the um, uh, cassette culture and which goes into the YouTube ultimately. So the movements, uh, the, for example, if you see the sorrow, the, 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 apparently you might feel that the movement is linear and it is changing from one to another, but 
it, there are also reversals there could be. For example, the Mysore district uh, is giving a feedback into the uh, textual version and the cassette version going into the YouTube version. So we have all sorts of moment. I mean, I have audios of that, you know, but I'm not going to play all, all those things uh, to you. So what, I'm, what I was trying to uh, suggest is that many of these things that I'm talking of are not really all that linear as I was trying to explain. So here you will see, uh, I'm using another figure. This is multilingual translations, uh, oral version. Uh, it's going into the textual or popular version, again, a multilingual text and multilingual narration and interpretation takes place. So the multilingualities, textualities and intermedialities, they all crisscross each other. They all gets like, like this are, if, you, if we consider these three as isoglasses, these three isoglasses get bundled up sometimes. They also get uh, dismantled at cert, at, uh, on, on certain occasions. So the system is, system of intermediality is highly a complex one. Uh, I will come to the last portion and try to finish it within the five. There is an interesting relationship between Kinnari Jogis, Natha Jogis, and the Sufi science and the religious performative public sphere. In this section, I will attempt to work out a schema to narrate the visuality of a Mughal painting. This is, it is called Khwaja Sahab from 1650 and located presently in the Victoria Albert Museum. But if you see the details, the title of the <coughs> is not exactly Khwaja Sahib, that is Moinajin Chisti. It is actually, it, it's English title written probably contemporary to somewhere, you know, when the, it was acquired. It says Philosophy Assembly, Khwaja Kutubal Deen, which is actually Bhakti Arkaki's uh, reference. Now, this is the, um, the, the, the visual. Um, I, you, you have to look at this carefully. See, this is actually a gathering of uh, people. Uh, here, three Sufi signs have been identified. You know, there is script, so you know, you can identify them. I'm not a Persian uh, expert, so you know, I'm trying to read it based on that. And this is the Hilux of Ajmer, and this area, it suggests that an Urus or a gathering is in process. The second row, this row that I'm talking, consists of actually a zikr performance. The, there are dervishes here and there are performers here. The performers are uh, in ecstasy. They are performing here, here, and here, and they are witnessing. The most interesting thing is the, the row here at the bottom. That consists of signs from medieval uh, period, starting from Raidas to, in, to include both Kabir, um, Gorak, Matsendra, and a variety of other signs. And interestingly, it looks that the painting, looking into the empty spaces, can be put into four uh, uh, circles, concentric circles, or four levels, or three levels, depending upon what is. One of them is the Ajmer and the Uras and the Darga. The other one is the sectarian, uh, holy sectarian uh, uh, center system, the Sufi uh, signs. The other one is the zikr, which is the performance. And the, and the, the bottom most one, although the, the entry, um, that is the official entry says the, they are watching it. I mean, my reading is slightly different from that. It's not watching. This actually, like any other performance, is constructing a hagiography. Constructing a hagiography of uh, the, uh, 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 it's constructing a narration. In the in the picture itself, here it's Moinadin uh, Chisti, first Bhakti Arkaki, here in the white uh, thing, Moinadin Chisti, who is facing him, and in between is another uh, sign. I will uh, 
read his name you know and he is 200 years after bakhtiyar kachi and moinuddin chisti uh, were at uh, delhi and uh, um, ajmer respectively and in this row there is no temporality some of them predates for example gorak and uh, matsendra if at all they are historical character they predate definitely everyone who is ever, whoever is in this picture raidas is earliest definitely but uh, they it has a chronology of, of its own but it has an interesting uh, purpose i'm trying to see what the purpose is i'm trying to see that the levels that i'm trying to imagine probably reflects a technique of medieval uh, or rather mughal or the medieval painting that means this is from rajamnama and it shows that hindus are muslim hindus and muslims are discussion in discussion you know the 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 platform here you know the enclosure or something and then there are two uh, carpets or dharis or whatever that is spread and on each one of them the hindus and the muslims are in a discussion this is the process of translation and there is uh, uh, you know a lot of discussion on that i will not go into that the painting has three or four levels just okay separated by a variety of levels setting people ideology public sphere religion etc setting is darga and uras most probably people are sufi saint darvishas performers and bhakti saints the public sphere is persian uh, slash sanskrit ideological writings performative public sphere ordinary people and the religion and the and the uh, uh, that links this picture is islam and bhakti sects this is a much detailed uh, one uh, the sectarian uh, marks are very clearly i have I, if i have gone closer and i have read the, uh, the this is uh, raidas uh, this is uh, namdev uh, and then you know uh, this is kabir um, matsendra gorak uh, and then you know these are two swamis you know who have not been clearly identified the the marks are both shaiva and vaishnava uh, on the head so it's very clear the difference uh, is clear between uh, the sufi and the uh, hindu signs because you know the 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 type of cloth and the rose uh, uh, you know what in japamala in in the hand is very clearly uh, uh, lets you read these things the details for the painting reads as follows this paint this is from the uh, website this painting of a gathering of mistakes was painted during the reign of the mughal emperor shah jahan probably between about 1650 and 1655 it depicts sufi saints and courtiers in the shrine of moinuddin chisti the supposed founder of the order of chisti sufis in hindustan in the 11th century ce they are in the presence of darvishas who attempt to attain mystical states by ecstatic dancing music and chanting three muslim saints are among them qutubuddin bakhtiyar kaki who died in 1235 moinuddin chisti himself he died in 1236 and mulla shah badkashi who was still alive at the time of the execution of the painting this is two centuries after in the foreground a group of hindu figures numbers of various members of various eclectic groups and identified by minuscule inscriptions this is the i have also used i have more uh, material to show that uh, darashiko with uh, mulla shah batkashi with uh, his master mia mir uh, in in the picture to the left which is again another 1635 so the, the, these two are almost contemporary and the and the enlarged portion of uh, the portion in which this is the where the arrow and staff is there this is bhakti arkaki 
um, this is uh, the person you know with a long coat is Mohinuddin Chisti, and the one in the center is uh, uh, Bad Bad Badkashi. The physical description reads that the painting, you know, opaque watercolor and gold on paper, allegorical uh, is is allegorical outdoor scene of a gathering of holy men, probably near the shrine of Mohinuddin Chisti in Ajmer. An assembly of dervishes watch the celebration of physical or whirling dance on the plinth of a building. In the foreground sit 12 Hindu religious reformers and teachers of the 15th and 17th centuries, and in the distance on a plain re receding to group of hills are various sideshows and refreshment booths, such as one found during the celebration of the Aras, uh, uh, Uras, uh, of a saint. This is the one, and I read them. The first one is Raidas, Pipa, Namdev, Sain, Kamal, Augar, Kabir, Pir Machendranath, Gorak, Jadrup, and Lal Swami, and Sam Swami. Now I'm trying to use that in. This is the portion that I have enlarged. In the distance on the plain receding group of hills, or various uh, sideshows and refreshment booths, such as the one found in the celebration of Anuras or in Aramela. That's where I, I want to come eventually. Of the two principal figures standing before the building, towards whom those one each side are facing, the white robed figure with a staff and a rosary is identified as by an inscription as Khwaja, Kutubuddin. Bhaktiyar. The friend and pupil of Mohinuddin Chisti. The figure facing him can be identified on the basis of the inscribed imaginary portraits as Mohinuddin himself. This is the enlarged portion. You have seen it already. Assembly of dervishes watch the celebration of zikr or whirling dance on the plinth of a building. I've, I've shown there are three performers here. You know. Yeah, this is where I'm going to link. And the signs have been, I have already seen that. Now, let me go back. Bowlier's study of the pilgrimage to Kadri Monastery, a Nath Yogi performance that discusses about the journey that the Natha Yogis undertake once in 12 years after the Kumbh Mela at Nasik, Maharashtra to Kadri near Mangalore in Karnataka. The distance is nearly 800 kilometers, and the group, which is called Jundi, takes nearly six months to cover the distance, halting at places associated with the sectarian links, maybe monasteries. After reaching Kadri, the Jundi of Natha yogis ceremoniously elect and anoints the king yogi, who takes over, to takes over as the officiating head of the Kadri monastery for the next 12 years period. It also appears that the Kumbh Melas at different places have their own jundis that culminates in activities similar to that of Kadri. For instance, Bolier further points out that a jundi takes place after the Kumbh Mela at Pushkar in Rajasthan, which proceeds to Mount Abu in a similar way. Such itineraries create a network of sacred geography of the Natha sectarian order consisting of religious places. Kshetra, Uras, Darga, monasteries, Matha, uh, and uh, Kankhas, etc., and devotees, Bhaktas, followers. Malinson's study on Kadri identifies it as a set, uh, site of Vajrayana Buddhism during the pre Natha period and postulates a smooth translation from the Vajrayana Buddhist to the Natha sectarian hold, suggesting a smooth transmission of ideas, practices, and the monastic system. These changes also resulted in the corresponding changes within the system with an elaborate network of yogi mathas and community, a yogi caste community, or the bhaktas. Drawing upon a variety of textual, material, textual and material evidences, Melanson further points out that such a transformation might be as well suggest, might as well suggest a model 
for the continuation of Buddhist thinking in the disguise of anatha and other sectarian group. We need to problematize this further. The sectarian writings of Vajrayana Buddhism and the Nathas, first of all, are rare and secondly, or mostly in Sanskrit. It is due to the dominance and practice over theory that such paucity of textual tradition could be explained. At the same level, particularly during the post 13th century period, the emergence of bhakti cults created a base, a mass base of followers bhaktas for the Natha community. Although bhakti's dominant medium is vernacular languages, whether it is bhakti compositions or translations of canonical texts or Puranas or hagiographies, the Natha output once again is significantly low. However, one conspicuous medium where we find proliferation of Natha's narratives could be seen in folk and Sorry to interrupt, sir. You have ah. five minutes maybe now? Yeah. I will, you need I will 15 finish. minutes at least for right. the discussion. I will, I will okay. finish thank in you. the next five minutes. Yeah, thank you, sir. Body-centered performing traditions, Kinari Yogi traditions, format of format or medium rework of the continually evolving system have done this. And vernacular performative traditions of the sectarian thinking, like the Gorakanath, Bhartrahari narrative, Gopichan narrative, Puran Bhagat, who is Chaurangina, they have done it. And they have worked out the regional variations. Three-level model of the Natha system could be mapped here. A Natha Yogi community that's writes in Sanskrit. No texts are significantly less canonical texts. A body-centered uh, tradition to take care of that through vernacular and performance of narratives. And the Natha sectarian community of Jogi and other castes who deals in vernacular provides patronage, both economic and aesthetic, both to Jogi community and to performing community, which is again lower, lower caste. And we find a similar three-level model in the Sufi system. A Sufi community writes in Persian, no texts are significantly less canonical texts occasionally composition. A body-centric performative system of vernaculars, uh, in vernacular, performing a narrative, zikr, kawali, and other things. This, and, and it is here that the music system that provides backbone to kawali and the music system that provides backbone to kirt and jagar are exactly one and the same. Then you have the Sufi sectarian community, which is a composite community provides vernacular, patronage, economic, and aesthetic. Um, we have Sufis and Natha signs overlapping in hagiography. For example, in, in Vadawal, in Maharashtra, Nasruddin, Sachirag, Delhi, and Naganatha is considered as one and the same. Then you have Sufis and Nathas visiting each other. The performative public sphere is common. Performance and audience sensibilities are one and the same. For example, Keith and Jagar and, and Kavali. I wanted to go to Shah Abdul Latif, but I will skip that. All of them put together provide actually a model of this type. Natha Jogi or Sufi systems using Sanskrit and Persian and writing the canon or canonless uh, communication are uh, relatively less canon. You have the body-centric traditions using vernacular and performativity and transmitting these ideas. And the Natha sec Sufi sectarian community, which supports them through um, uh, supporting the vernacular performances and the patronage to the Natha yogi community. The figure that uh, I have used here is exactly the same thing. That's, uh, uh, that is, here is a system of uh, uh, Kshetra or uh, 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 you know, the Darga, Mela, and here is the group of uh, sectarian, uh, and that gets here, and then here is the performative tradition. The, the last row, Natha sectarian tradition, probably is foreseeing or narrating a, 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 a hagiographical material, which is yet to take place, in the sense, uh, if you read uh, closely the, the Deccani compositions, either the, either it, is, it could be a poem or it could be a hagiography or it could be a, 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 
what do you call uh, taskira you know they all actually are composite in the sense takes their convention from a common pool that is familiar to the population of deccan i think you know uh, i will end here what i was trying to um, discuss is a possibility of a visuality um, getting narrated or the clues how a visuality get narrated within the representation system into 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 um, performative traditions uh, i think you know i'll stop here thank you very much thank you so much sir thank you uh, we'll first take the uh, questions from the chat box um so charulika dhawan says thank you sir for such an informative session can you please elaborate on how the religious and secular are connected through an umbilical cord in medieval indian literature maybe um that uh, could be that might take a bit of time you know for example when you are uh, religious in the sense i will not come to medieval i'll go to the early period the 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 plays dramas that are being written and the 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 puranas that are being written have a relationship you know let me go to um, kannada to uh, example see the early kannada jaina poets have a convention they will write a laukika kavya Uh, laukika in their sense uh, they this is these are the words that are used by them the one of the more popular version so they take either a mahabharata or the uh, uh, ramayana or some episode that is available in the thing uh, it don't it could be a, they can take a jaina mahabharata like that of um, uh, or the jaina ramayana uh, vimala suris they also can borrow it from the vyasa because and pampa being a jaina poet very clearly says that i am borrowing from vyasa i have, i'm trying to cross over the and swim over the ocean of vyasa that's what he says uh, but they also wrote a, uh, a dharmika kavya they call they call it dharmika so or or they they call it jinagama agamika kavya they they are doing jina agama and for that they write, uh, uh, write the life story of a tirthankara so you know this this habit of writing the two continues and it is here that i want to point out why a kshatriya has to be a hero in the in the in the even in the secular kavya that is because when the earliest person to write uh, a sanskrit uh, kavya and a sanskrit play is actually to the best of our evidence what we have is actually ashogosha you know around 150 so right from that time the the hero for the sanskrit epic has to be a kshatriya and this kshatriya uh, membership actually comes from the fact that he is the head of the agrarian system which he is ruling and the agrarian system is always ruled by a kshatriya and it in in the both in the buddhist and the jaina in the buddhist all bodhisattvas have to be kshatriyas born into a kshatriya family and in the jains all the shalaka purushas that means 24 tirthankaras nine vasudevas prati vasudevas chakravartin vagera vagera all number put into 63 sacred people they all have to be sanskrit so there is an umbilical cord of this sort you know we might call vikram uh, you know vikramarushi or any uh, thing as a as a sanskrit uh, uh, kavya with a hindu hero or you know what I, i we don't have to do that but the internal uh, elements get connected to a tradition of depicting a, and and this tradition starts at a much earlier place so it is that embelical card and i i can go on there are several instances i can compare and uh, sir, thank you sir uh, pavitra mm-hmm. asks uh, where is it I'm sorry I lost the question I think Ah uh, she asks I was wondering if there are any heuristic heuristic devices uh, apart from paintings I'm not able to scroll I'm sorry that can act as entry points into the into how we uh, you can read it some this thank you yeah I mean, my eyes are very poor to read that you know, <laughs> sorry sir. i'm trying to okay no yeah. uh, i think you know it 
the the heuristic devices exist in painting and also outside the painting you know what i was trying to say the these intermedial elements that we are trying to segregate you know they are uh, interwoven like a quilt um, it is the the looking at a painting or looking at music or a, or a bhakti composition in in a sung form is like trying to identify the threads of this uh, the quilt a uh, quilt means you know i'm using it. so it is possible i mean they have to be done by exercises of that type i think you know i'm a, however crude my attempt might be i think i'm what i'm trying to is to separate the the transmedial elements that gets into the uh, construction of a transmedial representation and then see how the 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 so this this is a model that with which we are very familiar for example the food and the diet is one and the same i mean the medicine and the diet is one and the same the lakshya lakshana poems could be the same that means the example and the exam, uh, exemplifier the the that the, luck, the theory and the practice could be in one so in that sense i'm trying to see whether the painting itself can also provide a model with that and this can, someone else can 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 read it very differently you know this is i'm i'm trying to read it to to fit into a particular structure and to a particular format it could also be read differently by other people yes it i think you know in a in a tradition which conspicuously lacks canon to these things i think it is the performance themselves which should which will provide the clue to understand and construct a model to uh, to to follow them so abhishek asks can you elaborate on the idea of intersemiotic translation with respect to intermediality yeah i think you know this i will skip because uh, this first of all needs a long time Inter you see yes. they, there if you if you read my uh, paper this uh, on the kirat arjuna episode uh, i mean if you want i can send it uh, you, to you abhishek there i have clearly tried to uh, intersemiotic translation is located at a particular point and at a particular uh, time and is within a particular discourse you know uh, intermediality theory post dates that so i think all there are several gaps and continuities between the two and there are more gaps between the type of Uh, intermediality that i am talking and the intersemiotic translation of uh, roman ekopsa uh, and 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 the theoretical discourses that were there at that time imagine the chicago school or the formalistic schools dominancy and uh, the way that uh, interart studies and the intermediate intermedial studies are trying to get into the uh, literary uh, theory discussions you know the uh, the the american model and the intermediality discussion starts around that time so you know, there are a series of uh, linkages that uh, uh, we can uh, think of and we need to establish so you know this 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 is probably for the last day a much more bigger discussion that we can take up if at all if we want to do it yes sir so sutir so thoray says the talk was really enlightening professor and clarified several aspects pertaining to intermediality in india I'm really interested about the idea of a marginocentric approach as envisioned in your paper on towards comparing Indian writing culture especially with regards to how a reversal of flow might challenge the dominance of a homogenized canon over a multiplicity of narratives can you elaborate on how such an approach might actually challenge the existing hierarchies of power uh you know i think you know the in the paper that has been circulated i have discussed the possibility of a marginocentric approach um and in this the material that i have looked at in the last two or even the last three sessions uh, if you don't want to consider the uh, sculptural uh, and the other material of uh, the panchatantra stories as belonging to elite or dominant it is patronized by a king but the performers the sculptors come actually from a margin and the knowledge system is also located at the margins and the kinari yogis definitely belong to the yogi particular yogi caste in karnataka and the other singers the painters you know there is a variety of 
the 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 medieval caste and professional system um, provided if we are looking margin is a term which we have uh, uh, borrowed it uh, in the last uh, 15 20 years uh, i particularly borrowed it from the east european uh, model of literary history uh, concept which they profusely use so that can margin can be only thought of at a point time when you want to contest a center and uh, and in that process you have to locate somewhere in the center and you we cannot have a imaginary uh, air uh, uh, fight in the air so the, the, the text normally occupies the dominant uh, discourse that is there that means the textual discourse in our case so i have located uh, text in the center and the margins are uh, the alternative ways including the painting or you know how do you de uh, construct a painting how do you deconstruct a narrative how do you deconstruct uh, a music piece how do you deconstruct a i mean these are all uh, re reading so the marginal centricity can be achieved by a variety of ways but the cent the two terms center and margin they have to be first of all identified defined located and uh, so you know, probably the, on this one also we can take up a little more uh, discussion at the later stage Yes, sir. Uh, Durjati uh, says, thank you, sir, for your lecture. I was thinking if the reversal of representational dynamics from performance to text would again lead us back to the primacy of scriptocentrism. Yeah, that, that's another marginal centricity, you know, if you want to do it. Um, you, you know, they, they, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm increasingly realizing that the type of uh, early model that I discussed and proposed uh, has uh, see it always was located in the milieu of the medieval indian literature medieval indian literature at that time to me was actually i, I did not show another uh, uh, figure which talks of uh, uh, um, pluralistic epistemology of literature uh, and the and the timelines the timelines construct that um, and and there in we in uh, i i argue this with reference to uh, kannada literature and also telugu and tamil you know they they hold good there is an early courtly epic which transforms into a uh, bhakti which transforms into a performative period towards 16th century around 1150 bhakti and around 14th 15th century you know I, what i have done is i have i have i've taken a cue of a linearity here that means there is a periodization possible and these periodizations could be mapped to a variety of things and economic activity change in ideology change in genres change in um, you know you know intermediality that is where i did these things including when does music starts coming and when the text uh, starts uh, receding this doesn't mean to say that text writing stop they coexist that's exactly what the pluralistic epistemology shows um uh, you can actually use the, instead of a pyramid if you are conceiving from um, uh, mono to multi uh, you can inverse the pyramid and say you know we we go actually from the plurality to singularity but uh, why the, and in in uh, in reality it's also retrograde uh, in terms of temporality because we will be going from plural 19th century to uh, quote and unquote Uh, mono 9th to 10th century which is actually a, a moment which we normally don't do so i i mean it it might also create contradictions although i cannot just visualize it but uh, um the for heuristic devices and to uh, bring it close to the discourse of marginality that is prevalent that is prominent today uh this trajectory probably is also inevitable in a way uh, we would we would, in fact uh, we we can also object you know many of these mono um uh, idea ideology centered discourses saying that they are not uh, pluralistic enough um, many 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 marginal discourses are actually also becoming identity centered so you know th 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 there is another discussion that is possible 
I was actually, when I suggested marginal sensitivity, I was thinking of a dialogue between um, uh, margins themselves, you know, a, 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 a dialogue at an entirely different level. And uh, probably the, the dialogue between the Sufis and the Nathas, the dialogue between the painting and the performative traditions, or the performative tradition itself permeating uh, communal, com communal boundaries. I think these are the dialogues that uh, suggest a, um, a multi, a marginal centric dialogue, marginal centricity of a different sort. Um, okay. Uh, he also asked, how can we address the hierarchies within one particular representational format? say within performance itself encompassing both classical and folk forms yeah i think you know the the picture that i use has a hierarchy in built uh, although it gets disturbed for example it's the sufi science and below that is the is the performers the performers of zikr or willing dance and then you have the audience outside. And then there is a bigger enclosure of a, a, a kshetra or a, or, a, or a Sufi center. And this is Admir. So, you know, those centers, you know, what I used was, I used not only the levels, but also there is a clear space between each one of them. In the, on the picture, you see that the blank space. I thought that this blank space is telling something to me. And I tried to read it using that. And that helped me in creating uh, levels, artificial. But not only that, uh, that helped me going back to Kinari Jogi. In fact, I have not come from Kinari Jogi into the picture. I, I all, my, all the time I was trying to understand the picture and that, that took me back to Kinari Jogi. So, you know, in a way, you know, if you want to call this a margin, different uh, way of margin, margin, I'm going from one margin to another margin or from a margin to another type of margin, a person who has not uh, studied much uh, the, the uh, Indo-Persian tradition uh, and coming essentially from <clears throat> the other side. So the, the, this could be a sort of a, um, um, a, a different experience for me to do this exercise. Okay. Thank you, sir, for opening the workshop with your fascinating and thought-provoking concepts. For instance, this alternative model for constructing uh, reading visuality and also for explaining how intermediality in India is not just formulaistic epistemology, it is also a social epistemology where the text can be realized in diverse tri transmedial formats like sculptures, songs, paintings, and how the text as it encounters different, uh, different uh, public spheres also expands and for suggesting that there is a possibility of perceiving pluralistic epistemologies via the visual components of a tradition by providing examples from in medieval Indian literature. Then for suggesting an alternative model for narrativity through the visual by giving examples from the Panchtantra and linking the Natha sectarian traditions to the itinerant Kirata Arjun uh, performative traditions of Karnataka who also move between uh, at least three different linguistic uh, regions, the Marathi, uh, Telugu, and uh, Kannada belt. And that a painting can also be read as hagiography uh, through your exploration of diverse images from the Sufi and Bhakti tradition. Your valuable insights have truly kick-started our workshop uh, in a fruitful direction. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you everyone for being here. We will break for lunch now uh, and we'll come back, uh, you know, uh, the. The link will be online at uh, 2, but we'll begin the next uh, talk at 2.30. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You summarized me so well that I... I, I, so I was making <laughs> notes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.